If you're dealing with a SIBO issue, in this video I'm going to help you understand steps you can take to improve that situation, but also steps you can take to keep it from coming back. Let's get at it. TC Hill is not a doctor and does not claim to be a doctor or licensed in any type of medical field. Don't be an idiot and use anything heard on the show as medical advice. This information should be used for educational purposes only and you should contact your doctor for any medical advice. Now get off me. So when we're looking to improve a SIBO situation or small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, when we look at the digestive system, we really want our beneficial bacteria to exist here in this large intestine. We don't want a lot of bacteria in the small intestine or in the stomach. Now a person probably doesn't need to call 911 if they have a little bit of bacteria in the small intestine and the stomach. Some can exist in those places, but we're looking at an overgrowth. An overgrowth means too much and you, you really don't want much in the small intestine or the stomach. And when there's bacteria in the small intestine, it's usually because the stomach was not acidic enough and the bacteria came in on the food that we were eating and it didn't get fried by stomach acid like it's supposed to. So then it moves down through the system and sets up camp in the small intestine where it really shouldn't be. So we want to take steps to remove that overgrowth or at least knock it down to a level to where it's not going to be so problematic in the body. So we hear a lot of good things about people taking steps like using like clove, garlic, or oregano. And a lot of times you can find formulas that combine even all three of those things. And I'm not going to give you any kind of brand or dose or anything like that. You're going to have to do your research to figure out those things. But this seems to be a successful thing. And D-limonene can be very effective, especially if there's bacteria in the stomach. Uh, D-limonene is basically just orange peel extract. And it's very good at seeping into this mucus layer and killing off bacteria when it's in the stomach, like H. pylori. A lot of times, a person will have an infection in the stomach and then it kind of moves down here. So it makes sense to take steps to kind of remove the bacteria from the stomach as well. A lot of times, the waste product from that bacteria is alkaline, which is further alkalizing the stomach and kind of leaving the door open for more bad guys to come in and join the party, but also reducing your ability to truly acidify your food and break it down so you can get the nutrients out of your food. You really want to acidify that food because that's kind of why we eat food. So D-limonene can be beneficial. Uh, mastic gum is kind of like this tree resin that can kind of move through this intestinal tract and kind of sweep some bad guys out. Uh, a lot of people feel like you can kind of chew on this uh, mastic gum stuff and then you spit it out. Or a lot of people will get the capsules and then they'll open up the capsules, dump it in a little bit of water and drink that. And then that way it's going right in here. It easily, you know, kills off the bad guys that might be in the stomach and move through here and do the same thing. Also not delicious, but it can be effective. Uh, celery juice is also very popular and can be very effective at helping wipe out some bacteria in the stomach and the small intestine. So there are options for things that people can do to kind of just reduce that overgrowth a little bit. But what you really want to do to speed up this process is you want to shut the door. You want to repair that acid function so that you're not doing all of this work because again, some of it, not delicious. Celery juice, it's not delicious. So when you're doing these steps, you want to shut the door so that more bad guys aren't just coming in and setting up camp again. So we hear from a lot of people that have success when they're trying to restore this acid function in the stomach by using things like apple cider vinegar or betaine HCL. And apple cider vinegar is nice. It can usually give like a little bit of a boost, but it's not going to be as effective as betaine HCL. And we have other videos where we talk about how to improve stomach acid. We'll put links in the description below. But if you don't know how to do that, my book, Kick Your Fat in the Nuts, chapters three and four, kind of walk you through how to figure out which aspects of digestion might not be working correctly and steps you can take to correct that. So it, the book's on Amazon, but I'm going to put a link in the description below so you can get the whole thing totally for free. And then you just skipped right to chapters three and four to understand how to help reacidify that stomach and bring that acid function back so that you're not just letting more bad guys in. Now, while you're doing this, you also want to reduce the stress in your life. If you're yelling at your boss, then you know maybe you find a different boss. But when a person is really stressed, they move into that sympathetic fight or flight state of the autonomic nervous system. So the problem with that is that we need to digest 
in the parasympathetic state. That's our rest and digest state. So if someone is stuck in this fight or flight state all the time because they're just stressed out, then they can't move into that parasympathetic state where the body needs to be able to make that hydrochloric acid. So when you're trying to take care of this problem, it's important to try to remove the stress from your life. The other thing you want to do is this gallbladder stores bile, which is this soapy substance that's made by the liver. And when the food acidifies in the stomach and then it comes down here into the duodenum, then the gallbladder squirts this alkaline bile down to help neutralize those acids and then some stuff squirts out from the pancreas, you know, bicarb and enzymes and stuff to help us digest better. But a lot of people feel like that bile has some antimicrobial properties. So some bacteria seem to thrive more in a little bit more of an acidic state and some of them thrive more and more of an alkaline state. But if you have this stomach acid working correctly, you're frying most of the bacteria and any of them that get through there are then going to meet this alkaline bile, which is an opposite pH, that's going to wipe out any of the other guys. And also when this alkaline bile meets this acid stuff that leaves the stomach, it creates this sizzle and like this reaction that really helps you bust the food apart and get all the nutrients out of that food. And I sometimes wonder if it's that reaction that really helps to wipe out the rest of any bacteria that didn't get fried in an acid bath. So if your bile's not flowing correctly and you're going to be doing all this work to wipe these out, you want to make sure you improve that bile flow. And we'll put a link in the description below for our video on 10 signs of poor bile flow so you can check that out and see, oh, maybe is this a problem for me that I need to put a little bit of attention towards. So beyond making sure bile is flowing, the next thing you want to do to really speed this process up is you want to lose the sugar. You know, sugar has the ability to feed this bacteria and kind of make them thrive a little bit better, and so does fiber. So that doesn't mean that you can't have any fiber. You just don't want to go on a high fiber diet while you're trying to take care of this problem. You want to reduce the amount of fiber that you're bringing in. So what's interesting when we're looking at sugar, when you do these breath tests with your doctor to see if there's a SIBO issue, they kind of stimulate that test with a sugar solution to kind of get the bacteria all jacked up and jived up and active and you know that should give us a hint that maybe we don't want to give them sugar to help them thrive a little bit more so we can remove some sugar the breath test is kind of giving us hints to do that and does that mean that you can have no carbs at all you know there's a lot of people that feel like carnivore might be the best solution for this because you're removing all the carbs and all the fibers that help these bacteria thrive the problem is a lot of people have this issue due to a lack of stomach acid that'll have that door open in the first place. And if you're just going to eat protein and animal fat kind of stuff, you really need HCL to be able to break that down. So a lot of people in this scenario, if they move to carnivore, are going to have, oh yeah, I ate some steak and it's been sitting in my stomach for like nine hours and they're going to feel pretty miserable. So you might want to improve these digestive functions if you want to try to go that carnivore route. But I hear from a lot of people that improve this scenario without doing that. I view that as an extreme version of really removing all your carbs and sugars, but you might need to qualify to take that step if you want to be that aggressive. But another big hint is that when you look at a lot of these symptoms that can kind of take place with SIBO, that they talk about burping or bloating and gas and abdominal pain and loss of appetite, nausea, diarrhea, constipation, malnutrition. You know, a lot of these things are the same things that we see when people are dealing with low stomach acid or maybe their bile is not flowing and they can't digest their food correctly. So when you put all this bacteria in here that's creating all these gases and maybe they're alkalizing the environment even more with the waste product that they put out, it seems to have the ability to really magnify a lot of these things. So if we're going to take steps to remove these bad guys, then we also want to make sure that this is functioning correctly so that the front door is shut and we're not just setting them back up, sending them back in, and let's do it all over again. And I also don't really view probiotics as an appropriate step to take while you're trying to wipe out all the bad guys. You already have too much bacteria in the wrong place. If you put probiotics in, then it's kind of like you're just putting the good guys in and it's just going to create a battle with all the bad guys, which can create a lot of discomfort, which is why a lot of people will try probiotics feel awful and like, oh, that's not for me. Those things must not work. And the reality is they just didn't set up the environment to allow those probiotics to thrive. So I'm a fan of probiotics, but I like to see people use them after they have, you know, reduced that layer of that overgrowth so that it's not just taken over the whole house 
and they've restored this digestive function. So now the environment is set up where they can thrive and they can replicate and then you know you have good gut flora in the right place. So you can see this won't be a one size fits all approach. Some people may have their bile flowing okay already. They might not have to worry about that. But when you're looking at wiping out an overgrowth like this, you really want to put as many of these things in your favor as you can to make the whole process more effective and a little bit faster. So if you need help restoring that acid function in your stomach, we'll have the book link in the description below totally for free. And if you want to better understand how SIBO usually comes about in the first place, jump over right now and check out our video on four common underlying causes of SIBO. I can't wait to hear about your results.